Hello, my friends, and welcome to Quartet. Sean Peterson's my name, and I'm from the Arlington Institute here in the little town of Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, just down the road from Washington and Baltimore. And we get together here at the Arlington Institute every couple of weeks to talk about some of the big changes that are going on in the world today. And we get together with our friends, uh, and we're happy to have uh, Greg Braden with us again to chat this today. Hi, Greg. Good morning, John. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm coming to you from our little studio outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, and uh, Mark Gover is with us. Uh, hi, Mark. Nice to have you back. Hey, John. Good to see you. And uh, I'm calling in from Maryland, not too far away from where you are, John. Yep, not just down the road a bit. As you think about all of the things that are going on in the world today, there are a, kind of a laundry list, climate change, and obviously the possibility of uh, nuclear war and some of the things that we've already talked about that uh, are on everybody's list. But there's uh, one event that is almost certain that uh, seldom if ever even ends up on the list, let alone rises to the top of it. And that is the uh, almost certainty of an impending kind of uh, magnetic pole shift on the planet. Now, this is not a physical pole shift where the North Pole and the physical North South Pole and where the whole planet flips over and, uh, you know, has tidal waves and all kinds of things which um, many people have suggested has happened in the past. This is where the magnetic pole, the magnetic north and south pole, reconstitute themselves and move. Uh, they decompose uh, where they're located and move around to another place. This is uh, interesting in, uh, in a number of, for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, if you're an aviator like I am, then what you know is that uh, all of the kind of navigation, most of the navigation, certainly all of the early navigation and most of the kind of the basic navigation, aviation is all done by the magnetic uh, compass. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, both magnetic north and south pole have been moving and accelerating, moving in uh, different directions that are not concurrent with the uh, physical North Pole. So you have to put in variation and, and so on to compensate for that. This is a, a process that seems to happen every, I don't know, 12,000 years or something like that. What you found is that there are these uh, ancient trees. Uh, many of them are these pine trees that are on the Sierra and Nevadas that have been around for a thousand years or something like that, or 2,000 or many thousands of years. And uh, when they do corings inside the, inside to the tree, you can see that there is a change in the magnetic kind of field and the orientation of them as you go uh, at different places during the corings in the, uh, in the end of the trees. The process is one of kind of uh, initially gradual decomposition. Like I say, the North and South Poles start to migrate they accelerate as they do so, but at the same time, then the basic uh, magnetosphere starts to lose its kind of regularity. It uh, starts to thin uh, and because, and then it starts to uh, become mottled, if you will, that uh, some places uh, become more north and some more south and more north and more south, and it becomes irregular in terms of the pattern that the, of the magnetosphere around the Earth. And, uh, and then uh, uh, presumably, and this is what the assumption is, that uh, in a relatively short period of time, two, three years or something like that there, then you finally get the flip and uh, then it restarts to build itself and reconstitute itself uh, with the North Pole, maybe in the South Pacific somewhere, and the South Pole up in Greenland, if, if you will, wherever it is. So, I mean, you can make the case in kind of metaphysical terms, perhaps, that this is the 
process or part of the process that uh, activates uh, DNA in ways that it's been dormant in the past. And uh, it is, it is part of the process that uh, initiates the emergence of a new human. Could well be that it's part of that. But what we do know is that as the increasing and changes in the energy and the uh, cosmic energy from the sun um, uh, affects the, hits the earth, it changes how humans behave. And it changes how humans uh, uh, feel and what their uh, health is health is like. So you have these combinations of things you've got behavioral change, you've got bio, biological and emotional other kind of change, you've got kind of climate change and to say nothing about earth changes, probably increases in volcanoes and earthquakes and other such things as this additional energy. It's the earth. Sure. The first thing that came to mind for me was around the relationship between geomagnetism and consciousness. And if we view our body and more specifically the brain to be like a filtering mechanism or an antenna receiver of consciousness, then there are many factors theoretically that could impact this vessel that is picking up consciousness. So it would make sense to me that that changes in the geomagnetic field could affect the way in which we are interacting with the consciousness field. And Actually, right before this uh, discussion, I heard a new interview uh, with Dean Radin, and he was he happened to mention that he had done studies on geomagnetism and psi, meaning psychic phenomena. And he, I, I looked up one of the studies right before this, and he found that um, in more creative populations, if there was a higher geomagnetic fluctuation, then there was better psi performance. Whereas for the normal population, the it was actually an inverse relationship. They didn't do as well when there was a lot of geomagnetic fluctuations. So all that's to say that our consciousness is, seems to be affected. Um, I don't know exactly what that means, but it seems to be very significant. I also think about the implications with regard to transhumanism. If we are merging with artificial intelligence and or if our DNA is altered in some way, I wonder what that means as the geomagnetic field changes and if it could have a negative impact if we are less human in some way if if we are not able to evolve as quickly and the third area that i think of is uh, around potential diversions so climate is one where there could be events that are caused by geomagnetic fluctuations which could be blamed on other things which could be used by governments to take away freedom so i always worry about things like that where the root cause could be covered up and other things could be blamed that are not actually to blame. John, this would be the reset of all resets. And I'm gonna share two, two perspectives. First of all, we have never seen the pole. First of all, it would not kill humans outright. It's, it's not a, a death event. Uh, and life on earth has continued through these reversals. We can see that in the geologic record. It's never happened in the technological age. All of our technology is based upon the assumption that the magnetic field is a constant. And it's not so much the flip, it's what happens in between. When the flip begins, it means the magnetic fields, they reach the threshold, they free fall to nothing. So there's a period of time where we have no magnetic field on the planet. Now they believe that's around three days. Then the inner core begins to rotate again in a new direction. The other cores do as well, and we gradually build the new magnetic field up to the, the stable that's usually right around 25 to 65 microteslas is what the, what the strength is. So we gradually build back up to that. So it, it doesn't kill life. However, all electronics would cease to exist uh, because all of our electronics are based upon uh, and inherently designed within the context of a magnetic field that is presumed to be a constant. So this is where it gets really interesting because the magnetic, the, the way we store information is based upon the assumption that the magnetic media is present. We would lose all information in magnetic media. Mark, what you're saying about consciousness, it, it, uh, yes, everything you said, and it goes even deeper because what the, the studies now, what the science shows is that our memories are not held in the cells of our bodies. The cells, the neurons, the cell membranes are essentially antenna. The DNA is an antenna. The genes 
our uh, even smaller antenna in resonance with information that's being held in the field. Well, that field is being held in place through the magnetic field of our planet. Depending upon how, uh, if, if we went into a full reversal, I think it's reasonable to expect we would lose a portion of our memory. And I think that could be a blessing. It could be the great reset that leads us to forget the hurt and forget the suffering and forget the hate and the reasons that we hate uh, and many indigenous traditions talk about this. They say, this is, this is how we begin again. It doesn't mean we forget everything that we know, and there are levels of, of how information is stored. We do have body memory. We obviously have muscle memory, and, uh, and we have localized memory, and then we have uh, you know, the, uh, the, the global memory. If we went into a full magnetic reversal, I don't think the powers that be could prepare for that. Because it's not like you're going to be in a uh, in a Faraday cage, you know, or something like that, where you're you're protected, unless you are not on this planet when it happens. And I think it's interesting. There's such a push now to to migrate uh, beyond the moon. I mean, they're going right right to Mars because it's more habitable. Uh, for those of you who are watching, uh, we'll be back uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, hopefully, Penny will be back with us, and maybe uh, Kingsley will get himself reconnected to the internet. But in the meantime, there are uh, many things that are going on at the Arlington Institute, where it's, which is where we're coming from. As I mentioned earlier, we're located in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, a small little resort town, about 100 miles from Washington and Baltimore. So we're in the Appalachian Mountains and uh, you know, surrounded by vortexes and other kinds of things. And it's a wonderful little place. And uh, we hold forth to try to shine a light on the path forward through this amazing kind of transition that we're all experiencing. Uh, we do that here at the Arlington Institute in a variety of ways. We publish a newsletter called Future Edition, which we've done for about 35 years, which is free and it's available and it uh, scours the horizon twice a month and uh, for incoming events and significant things that are uh, likely to shape uh, the, the way the future evolves. We have uh, Transition Talks, which is um, a monthly uh, speaker series that we have here. And both uh, Mark and Greg have been uh, 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 presenters here. And uh, Greg will be back in August, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah. Comes back every year to be with us. Uh, it's a marvelous time and we get a whole bunch of people together in the local theater. And uh, we also we also live stream that. And so it makes no difference where in the world that you are, you can participate. There's a variety of other things that we do here. You can find out the, all the information on all the programs at transition to at, uh, uh, arlingtoninstitute.org and on the transition talks at transition talks plural transition talks.org and so we hope that uh, we'll uh, you'll check us out and uh and we hope to see you again in uh, another couple of weeks when we come back and talk about another subject about this big giant change that uh, we're all experiencing so thanks greg thanks mark and uh we'll see uh, all of you who are uh, you, our viewers uh, uh in two weeks thank you so much Thank you. Bye-bye.